Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of College Hockey Talk. On today's episode of the podcast, I'm joined by the head coach of the Hamline women's hockey team, Whitney Colbert. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, Whitney, and how's everything going? Yeah, thanks very much for having me here. I appreciate it. Things are, are going well, just finishing up some of the end of the year meetings here and doing some good reflection. So appreciate you having me on. Yeah, what's the off season look like for a coach? I'm curious because I've never really had any coaches on the podcast before. So I'm curious sort of what a day to day is like uh, when the season's not going on. Yeah, it's a lot of just kind of wrapping up some uh, individual player meetings. We're doing some upperclassmen meetings, et cetera. Um, and then even just the little things like at the rink and um, cleaning up the locker stalls and ordering new gear for next year. So there's uh, there's no shortage of things to do even in the off season here. You guys getting new jerseys next year? We we get them every couple of years. Um, I think we we're probably just doing new practice jerseys uh, this upcoming year, and then maybe jerseys the the following year or the next one. It just just depends what rotation we're on right now. So. All right, all right. That just got me excited because I love seeing uh, some of the new designs that come out. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I haven't had the opportunity to do that here at Hamlin quite yet, but uh, no, it's been it's been a, a blast so far, just in my two years. Well, I want to start off this podcast talking about the beginning of your hockey career and kind of working all the way up to where you are today. Uh, so doing research on yourself, uh, you're from Ithaca, New York. So talk about growing up there and how did you start playing hockey? Yeah, Ithaca is obviously a, a very big hockey town with uh, Cornell University there and grew up going to the the men's and the women's games shortly thereafter. Um, and that was really kind of the thing to do, um, just playing hockey and playing lacrosse. Like those are definitely the two biggest sports in the, in the city of Ithaca. Um, and it just was, you know, just being a small town, um, at the time, I know it's grown quite a bit since then. Like that was, that was really how I started playing with my brothers playing. And then actually originally started playing hockey by playing roller hockey there. Cause there was a roller hockey league. So um, a little untraditional in that sense, but uh, very, very fortunate to have so many great like mentors and you know players to look up to both on the men's and the women's side. Yeah, who was your favorite player growing up? Was it uh, Cornell men's hockey player or Cornell women's hockey player? Well, at that time, the, the women's program was relatively new. One of my, my coaches in my youth program, or two of them, I should say, um, Megan Scholl and uh, Karen Cole, both played for the women's program and were pretty successful there. And then um, for the, the men's program, you know, there's a lot of, uh, lot of guys that, you know, we got to know, whether it's them coming over to play street hockey with us and a couple of them that are probably familiar is like Topher Scott or Matt Murray, um, you know, a couple of those guys that are, are legends. And uh, so it's been really fun to be able to, to get to know them. And they're obviously very supportive of the women's game and just a, a pretty cool environment to grow up in for sure. Now, during your playing career, you played in many different spots, but before college hockey, you played for the Berkshire School. Um, how'd you get the opportunity to go to that school and talk about your experience there? Yeah, that was honestly, that was like one of the best experiences of my life was going to Berkshire and, um, you know, formerly like Casey Bellamy went there and graduated a couple of years before I was there. There was a lot of success within that, that program, but, um, you know, certainly hockey was a piece of it, but more importantly, it was just, you know, I went to, to visit a couple of schools with my mom and my twin sister. And, um, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that we found a place to go together and, that was just uh, probably the most welcoming schools that, that we went to in terms of, you know, demographic, like it was obviously very beautiful, um, close enough to home, but uh, not too close, you know, a couple hour drive as well. Um, but it was, it was awesome. Just got to meet a lot of different types of people and really kind of uh, continue to, you know, extend, you know, my background in, in hockey and play different sports and was able to play varsity soccer and varsity lacrosse for, my three years there as well. So I kind of got the the best of all worlds, um, just playing three different sports there, which uh, was a little bit harder to do in, in Ithaca, I think just being uh, a little bit more central and further away from other programs. So that was kind of the, the main reason why I went to Berkshire is more from the hockey perspective, but uh, really just a, a transformative experience overall there. That must have helped you prepare for college hockey bouncing 
um, soccer, hockey, and lacrosse. I'm assuming some of those seasons overlap. I don't know what it's like in uh, prep school versus college. I know in college it definitely does. So I'm curious if it happens in uh, prep school as well. Yeah, I think at prep school does a really nice job actually with trying to limit the overlap. Um, in that sense, it's more like like college athletics. Um, I should say maybe more so like Division three college athletics. You know, where there's if you make it to playoffs, there's a couple of weeks of overlap there. But um, for the most part, in terms of like New England prep schools, it was really only you know a week or two that you would miss, and hopefully you would miss that because that meant that you were in the playoffs with another season. But um, it also like just allowed, you know, all athletes, not just including myself, but, but everyone else that were re really serious about one sport, it really kind of helped the overall athleticism um, to be able to play different sports and even be with different friend groups and uh, just created a whole other level of confidence, I thought, that was really important in, in my development. Yeah, I was listening to another coach and he was saying how he thinks kids today don't play enough other sports besides the sport they focus on. He thinks that's a big problem in today's world. I want to know if you agree with that or not, because I'm assuming you learned a lot from soccer and lacrosse that's helped you out in hockey. Definitely, definitely. I think that's something that like the specialization of, of sport, regardless of what sport you play, I think that's really important that you grow up playing a lot of different sports. It helps with injury prevention. Um, it helps with the social aspect of things. Um, and I just think it helps with like overall athleticism and that makes you a better athlete. And, uh, and certainly in the sport of hockey where you've got to be able to be very athletic. Um, but even being in a state like Minnesota, I've noticed that the sport specialization is much more prevalent here than it is in some cases and in certain schools on the, the East coast. So we currently have a couple, um, dual sport athletes here at Hamlin too. And certainly a big supporter of that, as long as they can continue to manage, you know, their schoolwork, of course, and continue to develop relationships with people on the team in the off season. What's the best hockey member you have at Berkshire? Uh, there were, there were so many, honestly, that uh, it's kind of hard for me to think of one, um, you know, just playing with like some of my, my best friends, a couple of them, or, or one of them now in particular is playing on the Canadian national team, Jill Sanye, um, a couple that, that went to play division one, like just being able to play with different people from different backgrounds and different countries. Um, I think that was just a really cool experience overall that I say I can't even point to one one moment just because it was such a it was such a great experience overall. You then went on to play for Trinity College. Um, talk about your college hockey experience as a player and what you took away from that. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a great experience. I got to play with, again, some some great players there at Trinity um, and ended up actually going through three different coaches in my four years there. So that was a little bit interesting, obviously, that the coach that recruited me, Andy McPhee, who's now at Endicott College, um, doing a great job there. Um, he actually went to Brown at that time. And then we had uh, Carson Duggan, who played at uh, St. Lawrence, um, was a part of some of the Canadian national team stuff previously. Um, very prolific player. She was fantastic as well. And then she ended up leaving and going to Ohio State. Um, and then we actually had Jenny Potter for my senior year. Um, so it was a lot of different coaching experiences that I had. Um, Andy was very different than Carson. Carson was very different than Jenny. And so I think like that's honestly one of the reasons why I wanted to get into college coaching was, um, you know, you're always able to take, you know, something away from everything that you do. And through those uh, those three different personalities and you know coaching philosophies, I was able to develop what made sense for for me and you know take what I liked and maybe some things that I would like to adjust moving forward um, to be able to to be my best self and bring the most I can to my team here at Hamlin. Yeah, that sort of uh, answered one of my other questions, but sort of what did you did you take something away from each coach that you think has helped you today as a coach and uh, what were some of the things you liked about each coach that you sort of are doing right now currently and um, I guess like what made you like want to become a coach I guess after you finished college hockey was that sort of something you knew immediately after your playing career that you wanted to get into or uh, do you, was it sort of did it take a few months uh, to sort of figure that out because I know a lot of players uh, it's very hard for them to stop playing uh, just because they love it so much but they will still want to get involved in the game but they just don't know what aspect of the game they sort of want to get involved with so I'm curious sort of how that mindset worked for yourself. 
Yeah, I think I, I always knew I wanted to work in in sports, you know, to what capacity that looked like during my college years. I was a little bit uncertain, just just really wasn't sure what the opportunities were available. And, um, you know, going into my senior year, the summer of in between my junior and senior years at Trinity College, I actually ended up being the USA hockey intern for a summer in the, the national office in Colorado Springs. And that was really the the moment and the the opportunity that I had, whether that was working with uh, at that time the 2014 Olympic team. You know, went through that tryout process, was able to experience that, get a sense of what it was like to um, to just help out and be a part of and and listen to some really great coaches um, during that time, and you know certainly meet a lot of prolific players at that time. You know, Megan Duggan, Julie Chu. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. Like it was, that was a really cool experience. And that was one that um, just showed me that, you know, I wanted to continue my career in, in athletics um, and then had some, some great bosses there like Reagan Carey. She's now the, the general manager of the PHF, um, the new women's league here. So um, there were a lot of really great people that I worked with along the way that that showed that this is the profession I wanted to be in. And I was fortunate enough, I think, as a result of that internship, honestly, um, and the connections that I created was um, the reason why I was able to work as an assistant at Connecticut College and actually got that position uh, in April of my senior year at Trinity. Um, and so that was that was a really cool experience. Honestly, I didn't even know if I could go straight into being, a, you know, a, a college coach, let alone one in the league I was playing in. So that was a bit interesting too. Um, but also got to to work with Kristen Steele, who has just done a tremendous job with you know developing young coaches. And you can see them now, you know, Maura Crowell from Duluth or Allison Kumi at Penn State. You know, they're the list for that is even longer actually. Um, but very fortunate to have some some great uh, some great bosses, have some great mentors along the way, and that just led to the path that I'm on right now. Yeah, well, how's I guess one of the other questions is, is how does your college hockey playing experience at Trinity help you as a coach today? Was there anything you learned as a player that you think you can apply to your job right now? Yeah, I think, you know, just playing in a lot of different roles, honestly, whether that was coming back from from injuries, I had a lot of concussions um, at that point. Uh, my freshman year, I got my like eighth concussion. So I had had a lot of concussions just being a smaller player and learning how to work my way back up into that lineup um, and being, you know, in like I said, in different roles within my my program at Trinity. Um, I think that's only helped me be a better coach because now I can have those conversations of like, hey, I've, I've been where you are. Um, and also, you know, you can you can really do your best to to work your way back into it and know that there's always a chance and always an opportunity if you're willing to put the work in and and be a great teammate along the way. So I would say that that's certainly helped me in my coaching career so far. Now, you got your coach, you started off, it says on your bio that you started your coaching career off with Cornell's men's hockey team as like a grad student. Uh, so what were some of the things you uh, did during that time or as an intern, I guess, with that program? Yeah, I was, um, I was actually interning um, the summer before I went to Berkshire. So it was actually uh, the summer of my ninth grade to 10th grade. Oh, okay. Um, so that was before USA Hockey, but it was, that was a really cool experience. Again, just being able to work, you know, with Mike Schaefer. Um, and uh, also at that time, that was when, uh, when Casey, Casey Jones was there and he had just left to go to Clarkson, I believe. And then Ben Sire and Topher Scott were there as well. So um, it's always fun to be able to catch up with those guys at the, the coaches convention in April just to see how things are going. But um, just being, you know, being around those types of guys that are, are really supportive, like I said, of, of, of women's sports, of women's hockey and, um, you know, just being able to see it from a different perspective and lens of, you know, reaching out to NHL scouts or, or emailing with different pro guys and developing those types of connections. Um, that's really kind of what got my foot in the door, quite frankly. And again, like just a, a testament to the the mentorship that that those guys had on me was one of the major stepping stones as to, you know, how I got to the USA job. And then the USA job led me to a lot of other paths. So 
the, the connection piece I think is so important. Um, and also having great mentors too is I've been very, very fortunate with. Yeah, what are some of the differences, I guess, between coaching men's hockey players and women's hockey players? Is there a difference or is there, it's pretty much the same, I feel like? Um, I haven't, I don't have a ton of experience coaching, you know, men's hockey players, but in the the limited experience I have had, um, and even just some of the things, like I'm kind of, you know, smiling over here on the other side of the screen, because some of the things I have heard is, uh, you know, that women tend to be a little bit more concrete in the way that they receive feedback of, okay, this is what you should do. And then they go out and do it. And sometimes this is not always the case, but um, there can be a little bit more pushback on the men's side about this um, or the feedback that you're giving. But um, yeah, I would say like my background coaching males versus females is probably not uh, extensive enough to give yeah. some real concrete feedback, but that's what I would say and what I've heard. And obviously, like you mentioned, you got your first opportunity as an assistant coach with Connecticut College. Um, as an assistant coach with that team, what were some of the responsibilities that you had? Um, yeah, like, uh, you know, recruiting in all capacities, going to, to games, watching games, connecting with college coaches, um, or excuse me, with high school coaches, um, you know, running the forward side of things, because that was a forward, you know, calling lines, calling power play, PK, et cetera. Um, Kristen Seal really did give me quite a bit. Um, and I think that's, again, like I keep going back to the, the positive mentors that I've had, like Kristen has done a tremendous job of developing coaches. And um, I think really the only way to do that is to, to give people, you know, a longer leash and let them make mistakes. And she certainly let me do that, um, but also did everything that she could to set me up for success too, and, and help me develop confidence. And so it was, it was through those responsibilities that I felt like I was able to do that. Um, so yeah, like calling calling lines was a, a big one. Recruiting was another big piece of it. Um, and then certainly a little bit of alumni networking there too, um, you know, getting them to come back to games and such. Um, but those were kind of a few big buckets that stick, stick with me. It feels like it was a long time ago now. Yeah, I feel like calling lines is the best part about being a coach because you get to look cool behind the bench. <laughs> it's a uh, it's it's interesting you know calling forwards versus b is a little bit different than you know the time of the game and the situation it keeps you on your toes but it's a, a great part of it you then went on to become an assistant at union college uh, talk about your experience there um yeah i know that was that was great i actually was brought on by by josh skiba who at that time was just recently hired so um, I was very fortunate enough to be able to work with him. He is like, a, again, a tremendous mentor, a great leader, um, gave me even more responsibility, um, probably in some ways than I had at, uh, at Connecticut college. And it just looked a little bit different in terms of the things that we had to do. So it wasn't, you know, one gave me more than the other. There was just a little bit more, um, more at the division one level that I noticed. There was a lot more touch points. There was a lot more travel with recruiting. Um, division three was a little bit more local, if you will, um, staying on the East Coast, whereas I would fly out to you know, Saskatchewan or drive out to Ontario you know, on a weekly or monthly basis. And then certainly a lot out to here in Minnesota as well. So um, really cool experience there. Um, Probably one of my, my favorite memories at Union was um, when we actually beat Penn State and broke a, I believe it was a 55 or 56 game losing streak that Union was on at that time. So that was probably one of the, the most memorable moments at, at Union. It wasn't, it wasn't the win. It was, you know, seeing our team accomplish something, believe in something, believe in, you know, the staff. And it was just a, a really prolific moment, I think, in my coaching career. And it was really a testament to all of the hard work that, that Josh Skiba put in and continues to put in today. And you can see the success they're having now. Yeah, it seems like the program's come a long way since he started uh, coaching there. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's just a tremendous guy. He's very detail oriented, very passionate. It's, uh, it's a program that is only going to get better and better. Now you sort of answered my next question, but what were some of the differences between coaching division one versus coaching division three? I'm assuming outside the recruiting, I'm just curious, like just in the day-to-day -day stuff, is there any difference between the two? Um, yeah, yeah, I would say that there's there's a bit of a difference. Um, and I would say as a result of that, like I've tried to bring, you know, a lot of what I, I did at Union to Hamlin. 
Um, so a couple of the bigger differences that I noticed were just the amount of like team video that we do, individual skills. Um, it's a lot more focused on like the details of the game um, to keep it like really simple here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, there's there's a lot more there's a lot more to everything. The the operation side of things, you know, the travel, um, class schedules, communication with professors, just because you're missing a lot more. The season is a bit longer as well. Um, but it's also been, you know, I, I'm very fortunate to have, you know, both of those experiences because again, kind of back to your original question of like, what did you take away from some of the the coaches that I had at Trinity? I've done the same thing from, you know, the the division one and division three experiences that I've had and kind of try to make a, uh, a really nice push here at Hamlin to do as much as I possibly can with those experiences and um, hopefully set our team up for success in the long run as well. Well, then looking at your bio, it, said, it seemed like you took a few years off. Uh, I'm curious, before going back to coaching in 2020 um, in high school, I'm curious what you did during that time period um, when you between union and getting the job at Blake. Um, so when I was at, at Union, I actually immediately, I went from working at Union in August and then uh, started working with the Chinese national team um, as soon as I moved here in September. Um, that was kind of part of the plan was to work with them. And so I worked with the, the national team up until COVID, which was March, I believe, and then um, was hired uh, in the fall at Blake. So there was a a little bit, probably a little bit less, uh, a little bit less time than maybe it, it looks like. Um, I kind of went from one thing to the next, yeah. but really <laughs> with the COVID side of things that that uh, threw a wrench into some of the quote unquote plans. But again, like really fortunate to be able to work with the Chinese national team and being over in China um, when actually COVID had just become a, a little bit more prevalent. That was an interesting experience in itself. Um, but you know, from a hockey perspective, like, geez, it's, uh, that was a really cool experience being able to work with athletes that didn't speak the same, you know, language as you and trying to teach them and demonstrate, you know, certain drills and kind of what you were trying to show them too. So that was a really cool experience as well. Like I mentioned, you coached one year at the Blake school. Um, talk about what it was like being a high school hockey coach. Cause I feel like there's some benefits of being a high school coach versus college. Cause you really have, I feel like you have a bigger impact on a player's life as a high school coach than you do as a college one, just from my experience or just perspective. Yeah, yeah. I think like you know, the high school years is such a, I keep using this word, like a transformative time of life. Um, there's a, a lot that you go through. You kind of learn a little bit more about yourself. And I could say the same thing about, you know, your college years too, of course. Um, but uh you know, it, it was, I probably only had, with only having one year as a high school coach, there was so much that I learned in terms of how to communicate to players. And, um, you know, the way I communicated with the the Chinese national team players was very different than how I communicated with those at, at Blake. Um, and when you're looking at really high level uh, student athletes, like, like those at Blake, it's always fun to work with them because they want to get better. Um, and, uh, you know, again, looking and, and shifting that over to the college um, phase of athletics, you, you get them in a different perspective. Your focus is more on hockey, whereas um, at the high school level, you're, you're trying to get them as best as you can, teach them as much as you possibly can so that you prepare them for the next level. So yeah. it was, uh, I think it's only helped me working at the high school level, even for that one year, just to be able to understand, you know, what does it really look like when they come in for their freshman year? Just because they're a freshman doesn't mean that they've necessarily been in college for, you know, quite some time. Like they're still learning and uh, you can't just flip a switch that quickly. You've got to continue to guide them as they they go through their four years here. Now talk about the Minnesota high school hockey scene and what's it like being a coach um, in that? Because I'm from New England, so I always find it hard to understand just why Minnesota high school hockey is so big. Like I see that they fill up the Minnesota wild stadium uh, for a high school game. And that's just sort of very uncommon here in the East coast. And I feel like hockey is super big in new England, just like it is in Minnesota, but it just seems so different how both those areas like treat youth hockey. So I'm curious from your perspective, why that is. And just talk about how big Minnesota high school hockey is. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's honestly like no other. Um, it's a really, really cool environment. And I think the biggest difference with, uh, with the state of Minnesota in particular versus New England schools is there's a lot of club programs. There's New England prep schools. Um, there's so many more options and different sports that people play on the East Coast. And then when you come to Minnesota, everyone plays for their high school. Um, and so there's a lot of passion, a lot of pride. And that was a really cool thing that, that I noticed too, is just like going to a high school game, I'm like, man, this is a great environment. Um, but I think that the passion and pride for the school that they play for, the where they grew up, like that just continues to enhance the experience, enhance the environment. And, you know, kids grow up here thinking and hoping that they could play at the, the X in the state tournament or win a state championship. And I think on the East Coast, just because of the number of options, like you don't have as much of that. And of course, yeah. there are places that um, you know, certainly there's a lot of passion out on the East coast too. Don't get me wrong, but, uh, I just think playing for the high school that they've grown up for in the youth organization, there's a lot of, uh, grassroots level here and just a lot of hockey players in general. So I think that's a really cool, um, thing that Minnesota hockey, you know, continues to have. And there's a, a long history and tradition of, of great hockey players that have come out of here as well. Yeah, I think the best comparison I have is the bean pot in New England is something that I feel like a lot of people from Minnesota don't understand how big it is here in Boston. And that's sort of the same thing, at least for Minnesota high school hockey. That's the best uh, comparison that I can sort of make. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, there's uh, it's probably more the proximity of, you know, Northeastern to BU, yeah. Northern, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's the same idea here. You can't go, you know, a couple miles without seeing a rink, it feels like. For sure. Well, then you got your first head coaching job at Hamlin, um, and, and at least in the college level, I should say. So how did you get the, how did this opportunity come about and what have the past two years been like for you uh, being a head coach in college hockey? Yeah, no, it's been it's been awesome. Um, kind of how I got this job is a little bit interesting that the coaching Ferris wheel, for lack of a better phrase, continues. Right. You know, one coach leaves and then fills another spot. And so. Uh, it just kind of came up at the, the right time. Like I had always known that I wanted to, to stay in college coaching. Um, probably coaching at the high school level was out of my comfort zone in some ways, mm -hmm. uh, which is OK. I think that's important, too, in, in your coaching career is to try different things. I'm so fortunate that I was able to do that and um, thankful for, for that opportunity. But I think being here at, at Hamlin has been has been great, like being able to practice and play all of our games at TRIA, which is the Minnesota Wild Practice Facility. Um, you know, we are beyond spoiled here. So I walked into a very good situation from a hockey perspective and the resources that we have and being kind of in uh, right downtown St. Paul here, um, or on the outskirts, I should say. Um, I've been very, very lucky to, to have the, the resources and the supports and, uh, you know, have really enjoyed it so far, so. Now, up until this point, you were an assistant coach in college. Is an adjustment being a head coach versus an assistant in the college level? Certainly, yeah. There's a lot more that uh, that we have to do, um, whether it's alumni engagement, um, you know, scheduling, practice planning for, you know, for our example here. Um, and I would say for a lot of Division three schools, having part-time assistants, you know, trying to manage that. And fortunately, I have you know, a handful of great assistants, um, two of them that currently play for the Minnesota Whitecaps, Denisa Krisova and Sid Brat, um, and then uh, Sarah Bustad and Alyssa Grogan, who also played for um, Division One programs, University of Minnesota and Minnesota State Mankato. Um, so I, I'm very fortunate to have so many great hockey minds around me um, that it makes it a lot easier, I would say. Um, but just trying to, you know, get into a better you know, a better sense of, you know, what needs to be done, when it needs to be done. And I'm a very organized person. I like to plan as much yeah. as possible ahead of time. Um, so I think in year two, it's already been much more smooth. Um, and I can imagine that next year would be, you know, that much. Uh, I won't say easier because it's never easy, but uh, it's made it, uh, I've been able to focus on, you know, the more so the the important things a little bit more instead of trying to figure it out as I go, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. Sid Brott's an amazing player. I think uh, she's so good at everything, both offensively and defensively. So that's a great addition to your staff and one of the nicest people I've ever encountered in hockey. Yeah, she's great. She's a, a great leader, obviously is a, a captain for the Whitecaps and a captain at, uh, was a captain at Duluth too. And um, just having like those really positive female role models is so important for, for our players to be able to see and look up to. And, um, you know, I, I can't name another women's hockey staff, Division One or Division Three, that has that type of um, experience. And again, I really just, you know, attest that to the location that we're in. So we're, we're very, very fortunate to have great, great leaders. Now, talk about the recruiting process and what it's like as a coach and what are you looking for? when you're recruiting players, because I was listening to an interview with another coach and something interesting that I thought was he was saying, like, you can pretty much easily evaluate talent now just because of the Internet, like you see all that stuff. It's really about what the person's going to be like in the locker room, because culture is such a huge part in hockey, because if you have a bad culture, it's not gonna, it's going to translate poorly on the ice. So I'm curious about, like, from your perspective, how do you try to find a good hockey player, but also something that's going to fit for the program and be a good person off the ice as well? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And that's something that's always been important to me. Um, whether it's a coaching staff member or players, you want to surround yourself with great people. And, um, you know, when looking in the more in depth at the recruiting process of it all, certainly you go watch a game and you're looking for the best talent possible, right? Every coach does that. Um, I think where, where people can fall short at times is if you don't put in the extra work to do your research on them, talk with their, their high school coach or their club coach, um, you know, have them on campus to meet with players, get, get a sense of how they interact with your current players, how they interact with their parents on a visit. Um, to me, like the more time you can spend on those recruits, the, the less surprises you'll get um, when they come to your campus in the fall. And it's certainly not a foolproof uh, uh, potion, if you will. Um, but you, you really just have to do your best ahead of time to put the work in to to make sure that you're you're getting what you, you think you have and someone that's going to be an asset for your team, both on and off the ice. And, uh, you know, even looking at their grades and asking them, you know, what's important to them. Uh, you can learn a lot about a person just through even a couple of phone calls and then certainly having them on campus and getting around them as much as possible if you're able to do that. Now, you're the first Division Three coach we've had on the podcast, so I want to ask you, what are some of the benefits of being a Division Three hockey player and going into Division Three? Because I feel like there's sometimes a negative stigma around it because uh, everyone wants to be a Division One player, but I've always said uh, it's never a bad thing to be a Division Three player. It's just as hard to be a Division Three player uh, than it is to be a Division One player just because of so many players play hockey and only a certain percentage of them actually can play college hockey full time. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you about some of the benefits that uh, you've noticed uh, being a coach and player in Division Three. Yeah, yeah, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there with that. Um, you know, playing Division Three hockey, I, I've noticed uh, some people even through the recruiting process when I've been at Hamlin or even at Connecticut College, um, their goal has always been to play Division One, and I think that is a, a great goal um, for for a lot of those people, and I think it's a great aspiration to have because. You know, quite frankly, at the Division Three level, we want players that want to play at the Division One level too, right? Because that shows that they're putting in the extra work. Um, you know, they're willing to go the the extra mile for your team. You know, however, something that I've really tried to uh, just ask our recruits about is what type of experience do you want, and what type of role in a perfect world would you like to play? And you know, with that question. I think it has kind of opened up some eyes of, okay, I want to be, you know, a top six forward or a starting goalie. Um, can you do that at the division one level? Or are you going to potentially be, you know, a fourth line player? Is that the type of experience you want? And that's great if that's what you want. Um, but also it's important to be really transparent and honest through the recruiting, uh, through the recruiting process, because you want to make sure that you're providing a great experience. And that's really important to me. Um, and so I think it's important to know, you know, what that player wants or has aspirations for. And if we don't align, then we've got to have a really honest conversation about that. 
Um, and so with my, my playing experience at the division three level, you know, I've said like, yes, you can, you can do all these things. You can have a great hockey experience. You can practice your hardest. You can compete for a national championship, hopefully. Um, and you can also have time to do other things too. Um, and that's certainly not to say that you can't do that at the division one level. I think balance is really important and time management is really important too. But I do think, but just the, the pure length of the season, there are more opportunities for you to be in clubs or extracurricular activities um, and spend your time in other places a little bit more so than maybe some, you know, division one program. So certainly don't want to put a, a blanket statement out there. There's a lot of similarities between division one and division three now with the quality of players that is rising, but um, but also I think it gives you a little bit more time at the division three level to do, to do even more things and be a part of different organizations or clubs that you might not have as much time for at the division one level. Uh, so one more question before we get to the non-hockey segment is, uh, what are your team's goals and expectations for this year and how, what's been the process like growing uh, this program uh, since you started? Yeah, the, the expectations and the, the goals for, you know, even just kind of looking at next year's program um, and, and next year's class is is really to compete for a national championship. And for us to be able to do that, like we've got to continue to be process driven, um, you know, take care of the, the little details. And that starts with your schoolwork. It starts with great communication. And then it goes to, you know, putting in your best effort and practice and going the extra mile of doing skill development or video um, review with the coaching staff and then taking care of the, you know, the non-conference games, conference games, and then you put yourself in a really good position to hopefully win the conference and go from there. So being process driven is really important, but it's got to come through, you know, our, our team core values, um, family discipline, commitment, and character. And um, those are things that, that we stand for. We talk about every single day in, in one way or another. Um, but, you know, we, we really have high expectations for our program for next year and know that we had some bumps in the road this season, of course, and want to make sure that we, you know, evaluate that. How can we be better for it for next year? And um, what can we do a little bit differently? So there's a lot of evaluation this time of season, um, you know, and I think I think that's really healthy. And you've got to find out what worked well for your team and, you know, make some adjustments for for next season as well. So we're now in a segment I like to call the non-hockey segment, uh, where I ask you some non-hockey questions just to get to know you a little bit more off the ice or off the bench, I should say. Uh, so first one is, uh, what music do you like to listen to? Ah, uh, probably more uh, more pop music. You know, Sirius XM hits one. That's sort of my go-to channel. Um, but yeah, definitely a little bit more pop or hip hop. Nice, nice. Uh, what is your favorite TV show? favorite tv show well we've been man ozark is probably one of them and then uh succession is probably my top actually yeah i've never heard of um succession i've heard of ozark before yeah succession's awesome it's on hbo i believe so good show you should check it out i'm not the biggest tv guy i mostly like to watch hockey and that's pretty much it but during the summer i need some stuff to help pass the time so that's sort of why i like to ask awesome what is your favorite class you've ever took in college? Um, probably, man, there were a lot of really cool classes that I took. There was one on infectious diseases that was really interesting. Actually, it was a night class. I remember that. Um, yeah, I think I pr think probably the infectious diseases one was really intriguing, very interesting. And it obviously applied after you graduate as well. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> too much so. <laughs> yeah. If you could have lunch with anyone in the world, who would it be and why? Um, it would probably be someone like Oprah. Honestly, you know, she's uh, she's very prolific. Um, she's done a lot of great things for for her community. Um, very giving. So I would I think it would probably be Oprah. Yeah. And then the last non hockey question is: What is the most interesting thing you've read or seen this week? Interesting thing this this week. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I would say, you know, I do a lot of, I listen to a lot of podcasts, a lot of leadership podcasts. Um, there's a couple from Adam Grant that kind of come to mind um, and it's more on like communication styles. And so I would say um, probably one of those, those podcasts with Adam Grant. 
Yeah. Do you have to have a different communication style with um, each player? Like it has to be a little bit different because I was I remember Minnesota State's um, coach. He was saying like how he thinks that he some players he like will be honest with them, but sometimes it's like he wants his he wants his player to let him know how he he wants them he how he wants to communicate uh, uh, with them. So I'm curious if that's sort of the same thing with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the the first questions that I ask is, you know, how do you like to be communicated to and with? Um, And it's certainly not perfect. Um, And when you talk to, you know, your team, there has to be a common message. Um, You know, but if we're in a a video session or if we're in a skill session where it's a little bit more one-on-one focus, then I can give them, you know, the feedback as best as I can, the way they would like it. Um, Like I said, it's not perfect all the time, but yeah. Um, I think the more that you can you can reach your players, uh, the more that you can effectively communicate with them, the more you're going to be able to get out of them. I think that's a really important piece in today's society. Now, getting back to some hockey questions now for all the younger people that listen to this podcast, what advice would you give to them on what it takes to make it to college hockey? Yeah, the the biggest thing for for me is like to keep having fun with it. Like, you know, ultimately I, I know everyone puts the, the work in, um, there's a serious grind to playing our sport, just the length of the season and the, um, the necessities that you need to be able to put yourself in a position for success, um, playing at the next level, but you have to continue to have fun with it. Um, and as soon as you stop having fun with it, then you need to really reevaluate, um, you know, what it is that, that you're not having fun with, because the, the players that I know whether it's on our team now, or even, you know, the ones I saw from like the 2014 Olympic team, the ones that were having fun with it were the ones that were actually playing their best too, because they were able to play, you know, with a free mindset. Um, They were able to just go out and rely on their, their hockey IQ and then their systems that they were taught previously, but you've got to have fun with the the grind of it. You've got to have fun with your teammates and embrace the, the small moments too. Now, what should be done to help grow women's hockey from your perspective? Yeah, great question. Um, this is something that I feel like a lot of uh, a lot of coaches talk about too. Um, and you know, I, I heard it once actually. You know, we we really do need help from you know the men's game um, and men's coaches for us to continue to to prosper and grow. And there's been a lot of great support, whether it be NHL programs or division one men's programs. Um, but I think that for, for the women's game to continue to prosper, we get the word out. There needs to be obviously more TV coverage. So it's more easily accessible. Um, but the, the more advocates we have, the better. And I think that the game has just been growing so, so prominently, um, over the past, you know, 10, 15 years and is growing yearly. Um, but we are going to continue to need, you know, some help from, from the, the men in the room and the men's programs. And I think that's a great thing. And fortunately, there's a lot of, uh, of, a lot of great people out there that do, do want our, our game to grow. And, you know, you look at someone like Todd Woodcroft, who is, is someone that came to mind. Um, he worked with the, the Winnipeg Jets and is now at, the, at UVM as their men's coach there. And he's just uh, a very prominent leader from that perspective of, you know, getting to develop relationships with women coaches asking how, you know, he can be helpful in any way and providing drills and feedback. So we need more, more men like that, uh, that are willing to, to provide their insight um, and just help grow the game. I think that's a great question. Well, before we end this interview, uh, do you have any shout outs you want to give to any of your family members, friends, uh, former teammates, and uh, which coach should we interview next? <laughs> Man, there's a, a long list of great coaches. Um, but no, I mean, honestly, I'm very fortunate to to have, you know, like I said, the the great mentors and leaders that I have, whether that be, you know, Reagan Carey, Kristen Steele, uh, Josh Skiba, um, certainly my my boss here at uh, at Hamlin, Jason Verdugo. Um, there's a, a lot of a lot of great people that have led me and given me some fantastic opportunities that I want to continue to to do my best with. Um, But even in terms of of coaches, you know, you can't go wrong with any of the really prominent uh, female coaches, whether that, you know, be Allison Kumi, um, you know, Meredith Roth, 
uh, Liz Keedy, you know, the, the list can go on and on. There's a lot of great, uh, great women in, in our game. And so very fortunate to, to be a part of it. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Whitney. I really appreciate your time. It means a lot to myself. I really enjoyed our conversation, getting to know more about yourself and the program that you coach. And I wish you continued success uh, for the future. And I'm looking forward to see uh, what other big things you and the program uh, do in the near future as well. Awesome. Thanks.